Welcome to the Veritas Podcast. I'm Scott Veritas here with my co-host, Ben Rebellis, and we're going to talk about something I've always been very interested in because I often ruminate, and I'm sure many of you listening do, on when did the culture war as we know it, when did wokeness as we know it start? Because sometimes it feels like all of this transported out of another dimension. You think back to just how things were you know, as recently as 2013. You could do that even in, say, 2017 or 2018. It'd be like, it feels like this kind of came out of nowhere. And what I think we're going to talk about today is how we got here to this point where it feels like wokeness is omnipresent and sort of omniscient, like almost authoritarian, like we're in a state of sort of woke authoritarian rule. How did we get here so quickly? What is the timeline on that? And I also want to delve into some of the prehistory of what led to the modern era of wokeness, because although a lot of people would probably argue that wokeness really, really sort of hit its stride and became something ubiquitous that you couldn't avoid circa 2015. There's a lot of really interesting arguments that have been going around in circles in the new right and conservatives uh, in the conservative circles generally that you can actually trace it all the way back at least to the civil rights movement of the 1960s and some of the legislation that was passed at the time that set up basically legal structures and cultural attitudes and ideas that led to victimhood culture and what we now know as wokeness and what for a time was called political correctness. But I want to get to that more towards the end of the show because I think it's a tougher topic. I think we're going to start with something a little more straightforward, which is when did wokeness as we know it start? Because you could say that there was something sort of proto-woke about what was going on in the 1960s and 70s in certain liberal universities and with certain ideas in the civil rights movement. But you'd be hard pressed to call it wokeness because it just the, the level of power, the level of influence really is incomparable when you're thinking about any time before probably the 2010s and before the rise of social media. And so I'll actually start off by, I'm curious, Ben, if I were to throw it to you, I'll ask, what what was the first time that you ever noticed something weird approximating what probably wouldn't have been called wokeness, but maybe like political correctness or just sort of like, man, people on the left are getting very illiberal. When was your kind of moment where you didn't necessarily have your woke breaking point where you were like, holy shit, this is an emergency for, I think a lot of people that was like 2017 to 2020, that kind of range. But when was your moment where you just started to go like, what is this that's going on on the left? Yeah, I think the first thing I could say is like the it would have been in a you guessed it philosophy of women class in my <laughs> senior year of college when the school I went to you know no matter what major you had you had to take like take a class in these different categories and one of them was like science and then but one of them was like ethnic and racial studies and the other one was just gender studies and I was a philosophy minor so I took the philosophy of women and I remember in that class sometimes early somewhere early on we were talking about John Stuart Mill who was a favorite philosopher of mine I, I like utilitarian thought at the time I was probably more of a fan of it than I would necessarily be these days and I remember saying something in class like raising my hand and saying something somewhat in defense of whatever non listen John Stuart Mill wasn't a feminist because nobody was down, back in the time <laughs> and for me just saying like something to the effect of like Listen, this guy was about on freedom. On he wrote on liberty. Like, yes, his ideas were backwards, but why are we shitting on him for having thoughts that were completely consistent with his time? I mean, so many of us would like to think like we would have been the abolitionists if we were around when slavery was around. When the truth is, most people weren't. And when it comes to when John Stuart Mill was writing, most people didn't think of women. I don't, I don't, and I don't even remember what he said as equals. Anyway, I'm getting aside the point. But I can remember saying something like that. Like, I didn't really want to shit on John Stuart Mill for these uh, ideals that were completely consistent with his time. And I got dogpiled in this class by multiple girls in the room, kind of by the uh, TA, GA who taught the course. And I remember thinking to myself, that was really weird. And also, I'm never going to talk in this class again. Mm -hmm. um, that was also the same class where the graduate assistant who taught it brought what in. What year would that have been? That would have been 2008, 2009. So oh, right okay. before, but this was also one of, I mean, these studies kind of came up in, in, in a lot of like the intersectionality. We can kind of talk about it a little bit later in the show that kind of applied postmodernism kind of started to become more popular in like the 1980s, 1990s. And so by the two, early 2010s, those um, fields had kind of 
uh, metastasized to having like the mm-hmm. huge swaths of paper. You've got the Jews Butlers, you've got the Kimberly Crenshaws and all those different things. Um, so uh, I just remember I, I'm not going to talk in that class anymore. And, and I really, I, I can say that through law school, I didn't really see much of it. And then the Trayvon Martin thing happened right when I was getting out of law school. And I think that was the year after I graduated. And I remember seeing a picture of students at my law school wearing the hoodies because that was kind of like the thing people did was like wear the hoodie for Trayvon or whatever. So the the first time I really encountered kind of the my first critical theory, I'd put it, would have been around 2008, 2009. Yeah, I, I have a theory that I think if you're in like a gender studies course or a black studies course, if you're if you were in the grievance studies arena, even if you just were doing it for like a gen ed, because I had to do that as well. I was asked my pronouns for the first time in my first semester school in 2014. So early in 2014, which according to the timeline, I'm going to kind of lay out very slightly predates like the real rise of the transgender stuff, which happens like at least a few months to like a year later uh, with Caitlyn Jenner and some other stuff that was going on at Burge of Elfie Hodges. But I think that it's very interesting that if you dipped into that world, you would find it, but only at the very epicenter, like not even necessarily in like a liberal arts college, but actually in the classes themselves, Mm -hmm. a women's studies class, a black studies class. It seems like you can go back decades and still find that stuff. Yeah. uh, If you're, if you're in one of those courses, I think, so when you mentioned 2008, 2009, I do think that's interesting, but I think it probably had a lot to do with the course you were in uh, it being women's studies because when I think about when you when you said that when Trayvon Martin's uh, death occurred, I almost said was murdered or whatever. But actually, you know, as we all know, George Zimmerman was acquitted. Um, when Trayvon Martin was killed, um, that is a very very important part of my timeline because mm-hmm. the way that I've always kind of seen it does line up really really well with Trayvon Martin. Because Trayvon Martin was, I believe, February of two thousand and twelve. Um, As a matter of fact, I think, fun fact, I think Trayvon Martin and I shared a birthday. I've always found that kind of odd. He was born, I believe, the same year and, 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 well, now someone's going to guess my, like, credit card password or something, but I think think we're born around the same time. (laughs) I'll probably edit that out later. But in any case, Trayvon Martin was, uh, his death was the birth of the Black Lives Matter hashtag. But the interesting thing about the Trayvon Martin's death is that there was not really widespread rioting around it. And I think a lot of people forget that. They'll go, oh, yeah, Trayvon Martin was the first Black Lives Matter. And it's like, yes, you're correct. That was when the Black Lives Matter hashtag started to come up. But it didn't have – I mean, you have Barack Obama saying if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon, which was kind of this very weird moment and also kind of weirdly racist (laughs) Thing yeah. for Barack Obama to say about black people as a black man. And it's like, oh, if I had a son, he'd look exactly like this other black kid, of course. Um, and I but, think if Barack Obama had a son, he wouldn't have been engaging in like walking around, you know, the, the streets of wherever Zimmerman was patrolling. I don't remember the details of that case, but I have a, I have a feeling Barack Obama's son would be driving a nice car just, in a nice just, area just of Chicago. Eating some Skittles, just yeah. getting a nice tea. That's what they kept saying over and over again. It was so funny. They would post all these pictures yeah. of Trayvon, who was 17 when he died. They kept posting pictures of him when he was like 12 as if that was like contemporaneous. But in any case, the Trayvon Martin thing is a really important flashpoint because what I'll say as my theory to posit, and I'm curious if this, it's it probably lines up pretty closely with your experience based on what you've already said, Ben, but I believe the culture war as we know it and wokeness as we really know it now is something that is sort of unavoidable began in 2014. And I'm going to explain why later, but I think that 2012 and 13 are what I consider to be sort of the the years of the battle lines being drawn, of some mm-hmm. of the seeds being planted, although later we're going to talk about how really the seeds were planted decades earlier. I would say the contours of the culture war and the battle lines uh, being drawn kind of took place in 2012, even though it doesn't really start until 2014 with Gamergate and uh, Mike Brown getting shot and there was widespread rioting. Because in 2012, you have all of these events that are like very tame by today's standards, but all of the storylines and players and sort of the, the story beats are in place. And mm-hmm. you can't really find anything before 2012 that rises to quite the same level. Uh, you know, you could find a thing here or there, like what happened to Rodney King um, or something like what happened with Anita Hill. But it, it's so incredibly different in the early 90s, the reaction. I mean, the National Guard was called in 
to, to Los Angeles in 1992, which is inconceivable today. Tom Cotton almost seemed to get his head cut off. I mean, somebody at the New York Times basically did get their head cut off just for yep. publishing an op-ed saying yep. they should bring in the National Guard. Um, and then, of course, all the staff at the New York Times like apologized for it like two years later. Very brave of them. But um, yeah, in James any case, Bennett, that's right. That's James, James Bennett James was Bennett. fired that summer yeah. um, for allowing someone else who was a U.S. senator, you know, and normally the paper of record would allow a U.S. senator to speak their mind. But no, that apparently caused harm to the black correspondents of the New York Times. So we had to ax James Bennett. Yeah, that was a truly, truly shameful episode of 2020, which I'm going to posit later was basically the end of the culture war. I, I consider it kind of a six year affair and that we're in kind of something other than a culture war right now. But to get to start from the beginning, so as not to confuse people too much, 2012, there are three things that I think of that at the time you almost, unless you were exceptionally almost clairvoyant unless you had like a Nostradamus level of predicting ahead. Although I don't know, some people like Orrin McIntyre would probably say it's hilarious that I'm saying that, but right. I really think unless you were like cl clairvoyant, you wouldn't have seen coming what was coming. But in retrospect, you see the connections. There's three things. Trayvon Martin's death because of the birth of the Black Lives Matter hashtag, because we're creating this dynamic of a non-white person. George Zimmerman was not uh, white, but he also was not black. He was Hispanic. A non-white person shooting a uh, black person, George Zimmerman, also not a cop, so it wasn't quite as big of a deal, and it becoming this big uproar, even though in the end it seemed like the evidence suggested it was much more complicated than a simple murder case. It, the evidence pretty much showed definitively that uh, Trayvon Martin had assaulted George Zimmerman before he was shot and probably stomped his head into the curb a couple of times, you know, engaged in some pretty uh, high levels of brutality and got shot one time in the chest and was killed as a result. Um and, and when George Zimmerman is acquitted, again, there isn't widespread rioting, but there still was the, there was the portrayal of George Zimmerman and the portrayal of Trayvon Martin that we would become very accustomed to for the next six years, leading all the way up to George Floyd, where it gets to unreal levels and Jacob Blake and Rayshard Brooks and all of that. The other thing in 2012 is uh, Anita Sarkeesian, mm. who a lot of people listening to the show, I'm sure are probably very big fans of. Uh, Anita Sarkeesian, who would become a huge integral figure in the sort of Gamergate, you know, gaming is misogynist, feminist revolution of circa 2014, she begins her Kickstarter campaign for her series Women vs. Tropes in Gaming in 2012, and it becomes not as big of a story as, of, as Gamergate, but a pretty big story, as you'll all recall. This happens the same year that Trayvon Martin is killed. It becomes a pretty big kerfuffle in the gaming community, but it's kind of contained to gaming in a way that Gamergate itself was not. But again, it is very clearly connected to Gamergate. So that's why I call 2012 kind of the, the year where if you had your ear to the ground, you maybe should have known in retrospect something was coming. There's a third thing I think a lot of people forget. This is one that I think a lot of people forget. Barack Obama announced in 2012 that he supports same-sex marriage. And something crazy happened. And I was very excited about it at the time as a 17-year-old you know, liberal. And that was that the Democratic Party folded like a wet paper towel on what they began to call marriage equality. For years, no major party had actually had that as their platform. It was imp it was a non-starter with Republicans, and it was eh, lukewarm with Democrats, where some of the more liberal Democrats supported it, and most did not, including Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. There was a cavalcade of support for same-sex marriage that occurred with Democratic members of the Senate caucus, Democratic governors, the whole Democratic Party. I believe their platform in 2012 included what they began to call marriage equality after Barack Obama announced he supported same-sex marriage. So the contours of the battle we would get to become accustomed to so much more a few years later, on my timeline, I really say that those battle lines, those contours are drawn in 2012. 2013, some interesting things happen. Gender identity disorder is removed from the DSM. Uh, women are given full access to combat and infantry roles in the armed forces. But those are things that are a little bit more under the radar. Obviously, most people don't read the DSM or are not active military personnel. So really, I point to 2012 as kind of like it wasn't the start, but it was this year where when you look back at it, even though no one would ask you for your pronouns in 2012, that no one would ask you for that unless you were in like a gay studies class or something. Yeah. That was not a thing. Uh, unless you were like on Tumblr. Um, but there were things happening that basically said, again, Anita Sarkeesian, Trayvon Martin, Obama and same-sex marriage, they said, 
sexual minorities, women, and black people, and occasionally we'll throw a bone to Muslims and Latinos too, but mostly black people, are going to become these cause celebres that we are going to use as a cudgel to beat over the heads of people we accuse of being bigots. And this is going to be the new playbook. Todd Akin also kind of created a bit of a kerfuffle at the time where it became a whole thing of like Republicans support rape and rape culture. That's also in 2012. The war on women, right? That rhetoric starts to come up. So I always think of 2012, a year where I was admittedly, uh, I think I, I called myself a socialist at the time, but I don't, I didn't even know what socialism meant. I was very young. <laughs> hey, uh, you're like I, most of them. Yeah. I was an enthusiastic Obama supporter though. I was too young to vote, but I did support him. And uh, I look back on it. There are things I look back on fondly about 2012, like not being asked what my pronouns were under pretty much any circumstances. But in retrospect, it was a year that was sort of the harbinger for what was to come. Yeah. Um, I, and one thing, one really good resource or perspective, and maybe this is like a, a sub theory going on at the same time these things are, is I think I've, I've talked about this on this show, but um, the Free Press, which is Barry Weiss's outlet, they put out a podcast series called The uh, Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. And it's like six or seven parts, and it's not all about J.K. Rowling. And I think it's the third episode after they kind of go through like the early days of like the... Uh, Christian Orthodox backlash against Harry Potter. I mean, it became one of the most banned books in the world because, you know, devil, whatever. <laughs> um, what a weird time that was. But but Megan Phelps Rubber, who hosts that, uh, does this really great piece in the third episode of the, the, the kind of internet culture wars between those more aligned with like Tumblr which had a more like feminine or feminine energy cl- inclusivity. You start hearing about other kin and that's why like, oh, the trans stuff comes up. And then what was going on on 4chan. And then once those communities had <laughs> developed how they started messing with each other and that this kind of created this, like at least online, these kind of, that's where the battlegrounds were being drawn between the kind of these two ext- extremes. Then you've got gradations in the middle. Um, which I think is a really interesting perspective. It's probably going on almost about the same time that we're talking about these events in 2012, 2013. And uh, to my mind, uh, and the other the resource, other resource I pull from here is um, The Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff, who I believe they published the piece on which that book was written or founded they kind of pinpointed it to about 2014 is when they saw the incredible increase in anxiety and depressive symptoms amongst teenagers, especially teenage girls. Um, And then they, they kind of pull, they have a lot of cool theories in there that are the the current, the modern wokeness is like anti-cognitive behavioral therapy, like wokeness, you know, wants you to catastrophize and think of the world as good versus evil. And then, of course, they attribute a lot of the, the the spike around that time to the rise in smartphone and social media usage, um, which is kind of an interesting question of how much that was a catalyst, what allowed people, because what social media allowed people to do and, and, you know, the proliferation of us all having something in our pockets, is it really allowed for the performative aspect of communication to skyrocket? Before that, you could maybe in your small town newspaper, get a little op-ed with your crazy opinion, right? Maybe your friends knew you as that person who had some crazy theory about something. But, but until then, you couldn't publish to the world at large. And when people were able to publish to the world at large, to react to other people publishing at the world at large, to show how uh, compassionate and how much of an ally they were. That really was, you know, what threw the gasoline on that fire. I, I would say it this way. If you were in college in 2008, 2009, this wouldn't have been as big of a thing for you, Ben. But in college, it, th- this was a thing you could do, I feel like, up until a few years ago when people started to wise up to the sort of male feminist uh, vibe and what that yeah. usually entails on a deeper level. But what you could do if you were in a situation like Ben was in his class is you could all of a sudden start spouting a bunch of feminist rhetoric on Facebook and get a bunch of likes from some of the cuter girls in your women's studies class. And whether you get laid or not, and some guys I think actually did get laid that way from like 2014 to maybe 2018, kind of the the height of sort of BuzzFeed feminism. I think some guys did successfully use that as a mating strategy. But it, it, in the last like five years, I think it's fallen pretty far out of favor as people have kind of more, uh, you know wised up to it. But I think yeah. that was a huge thing when I was in college. And I will admit to, not to like a heavy extent, I wasn't like a 
over the top male feminist. But there were times where, especially because I was involved in the college Democrats, particularly when the Access Hollywood came out, uh, Access Hollywood uh, tapes came out of um, Donald Trump. I did. That was probably one of my weakest moments where I was as close as I ever was to being an SJW. I did go pretty hard on the like, how could somebody say these things? And, you know, all these girls are liking my Facebook posts and it's like, they know that I'm an ally of, I totally, you know, cop to that. That was me probably at my most obnoxiously liberal and almost male feminist adjacent, even though I actually was critical of feminism even at the time. Um, But that, you know why? Yeah. Getting late is awesome. (laughs) And And some feminists are very hot. I will say, and that start and that, that hot, Feminist was like a new thing in 2014. Before, before that, it was just lesbians and like not great looking older professors. Like, no, 2014 is the update. And I'm going to talk about that later. But there was this update where normal girls with normal looks would uh, uh, engage in sort of Beyonce feminism. And I'm actually, Beyonce plays a, plays a very key role in what I'm going to say about 2014. There's a thing a lot of people forget that Beyonce did. But Ben, I don't know if you were going to jump back in or no, no, no. I, I just it's easy to say I'll go along. Like it, it's so easy if some if somebody's saying like if someone you're trying to date or sleep with is saying I think women should have equal rights. I think that men treat them badly. To go, uh huh, yeah, that's absolutely right. <laughs> Because one, I actually believe that, just not in the way that leads to the creation of insane center, intersectional. Um, uh, social justice theories, but I'm willing to walk along in that parade, you know, then we can get some drinks. And at the time, I will say, I didn't know how terrible it, it all was. You know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of guys look back on that. Again, I didn't, this isn't something I did a lot. I wouldn't say I used it as a mating strategy. I didn't really take it that far. I think a lot of guys did, but there would be at least the occasional because I was already fairly liberal to begin with, posting things, especially around Donald Trump and his misogyny, that where you know some cute girl I sit next to in class likes it on Facebook, and I get the inevitable male reaction to that, which is like some cute girl liked my status on Facebook. Which but that's no different than going on a first date and she sits down and goes, "Man." Uh, you ask, what's your favorite band? And they go, I love Nickelback. And you go, I love Nickelback too. What's your favorite song? Yeah. Like, it's not any different. It's just this philosophy that they liked instead of a really shitty band. It feels that way until years later, you realize how how deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, how, and how that, it's sort of like Jordan Peterson's do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. In the short term, it's just a nice little thing to do to be agreeable or whatever. But in mm-hmm. retrospect, you end up regretting it because in the long term, the 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 train doesn't stop. The rabbit hole keeps getting deeper. The world keeps getting darker. There's no limiting principles. The slippery slope keeps getting slipperier, more slippery, <laughs> if you will. Um, but in any case, 2014. I want to harp on this year because 2014 is the what I refer to as the sort of Cambrian explosion of what some people call white girl feminism. I'm going to call sort of Buzzfeed or one of my favorite terms is Beyonce feminism, and I'm going to bring up a few things that happened in 2014 so that I can not only pinpoint the year that I believe the culture war really started in earnest, but I can give you a month because there was a month where within a two-week span, three huge things happened that would sort of change the way people interact with culture and politics forever by making wokeness or political correctness, as as it was often called at the time before wokeness was kind of a more popularized term. It, it, you you ha- sort of had to engage with it for the first time in our history as as a society. Before that, you could kind of ignore it. Uh, you know, maybe if you were in like really deep like atheist subcultures or Tumblr, you might encounter it. But as long as you weren't in one of those subcultures, you could be in a major subculture like gaming and avoid it for the most part. You could be mm-hmm. watching the VMAs and avoid it for most for the most part. Uh, but in 2014. A few things happened, including something that happens at the VMAs that I think so many people sleep on and forget. In 2014, the two things that probably most people remember is Gamergate happens. Uh, that whole thing, the sort of assault on gaming as this misogynist hobby full of would-be rapists. Uh, Anita Sarkeesian, I, this isn't a Gamergate video. You know, we, I, I know that's kind of a meme like Gamergate. We're going to talk about it in 2023. So I'll just real quickly say, you all know what Gamergate is. It happened in August of 2014. We don't have to relitigate Gamergate too much on today's show. But people forget this. The same like two-week span that Gamergate happened, that Gamergate exploded and ended up becoming a months, if not years-long fiasco, Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson by Darren Wilson. 
and becomes the first you know, Black Lives Matter martyr to be shot by a, by a cop and to have widespread rioting that is unusually unabated by riot control police since at least the uh, LA riots. You know, it's 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 some of the most widespread rioting we see. And of course, we see it six years later, even more so with George Floyd. But that really became in 2012, you didn't have kids running around campus saying, hands up, don't shoot. Mm. In 2014, you get that. I actually was in college and students were literally marching around the campus saying, hands up, don't shoot, which of course ended up being not something that happened. Michael Brown did not put his hands up and say, don't shoot. He wrestled over the gun that a a cop had after manhandling a store clerk and shoplifting, and he got shot for his stupidity and attempting to grab the firearm of a police officer, which has like a 90% chance of getting you shot. Um, Yes. So (laughs) the official legal opinion of the resident attorney and legal expert, Ben Rebellis, is that if you reach for a cop's gun, you said what, Ben? You're probably going to get shot. You're probably going to get shot. Thank you. Yeah, that's probably what happens. I I can actually, I I really usually put out disclaimers that I don't give legal advice on this show. I feel pretty confident I'm not going to get sued by saying <laughs> straight up legal advice the, from Ben Rebellis. The Black Lives don't Matter grab cops guns. The Black Lives Matter caucus is pretty freaking litigious. Who knows? Ben <laughs> Crump's going to be knocking on your door any day now. <laughs> ben Crump, of course, the uh, the Attorney General of Black Lives Matter, as people know it. But anyway, we do a whole show about Ben Crump. He's he's Probably. he's just tremendous. But uh, you know, uh, Mike Brown get shot by Darren Wilson. That becomes really the beginning of Black Lives Matter as we know it, which is co- the idea that cops are like exterminating black people like cockroaches. That whole idea really starts with that out of this world narrative that like, you know, interstellar narrative uh, occurs really for the first time in 2014, the widespread rioting, things we didn't see with Trayvon Martin. Gamergate takes what was started by Anita Sarkeesian, blows it up to an astronomical level. But there's another thing having to do with feminism that happens that I think is so underrated. And it's if you're watching the VMAs in 2014, the same like two week span that Michael Brown is shot and killed by Darren Wilson and Gamergate explodes. Beyonce performs at the VMA. She sings and dances her ass off. It's a great performance. Very talented lady. In my opinion, a little boring, not my kind of music, but clearly a very talented lady sings and dances her ass off at the VMAs. But at the very end of her set, which is a long set, she's Beyonce, she can dance and sing as long as she wants, right? At the end of this long set where she's just singing and dancing to her music, her good old Beyonce pop music, at the very, very end, the lights go dim, the lights go dark at the VMAs, and a giant neon sign, people forget this, a giant neon sign that says one single word is illuminated behind Beyonce as she stands majestically. And the word is feminist. Hmm. You can find this. People, I remember seeing it live and being like, the fuck? Because it is so out of nowhere. It, it is the first thing that ever felt to me like what I didn't know to call, to call it this at the time, but was like a psyop. Like, mm. what are they trying to do here? Because Beyonce, who is the ultimate like white girl idol who, white girl who wants to be cool to her black friends who could give two shits about Beyonce. <laughs> like, say, like, if we're going to talk ultimate, about ultimate white girl idols, I think we have to put Taylor Swift at the top. T- Taylor Swift as well. And she has her moment at the VMAs a few yeah. years earlier with good old Kanye West. God God only knew what was going to happen to him at the time. But yeah, we, <laughs> we thought, thought he, we thought that was his low thing. point. <laughs> it was like, oh, Barack Obama calls him a jackass. <laughs> and it's like, hey, nothing will ever happen to Kanye that could possibly be worse than this. Nothing, he cannot get any lower. This is his lowest point. No, no one, no one called Kanye in gimp mask on Alex yeah. Jones's show. Yeah. So, <laughs> so in any case, that moment when Beyonce stood in front of the word feminist, it's so inexplicable. You could only call it a psyop. She's literally saying, it's obvious that this was an attempt by her and her handlers to say to women across the country, like, feminism is cool. Up until 2014, feminism was for angry lesbians. Everyone thought it was just this man-hating, angry lesbian thing. It had a bad PR. Feminism mm-hmm. had bad PR. Beyonce in that moment, uh, c- coupled with Gamergate, starts to really deliver this new sort of pro programming update, this sort of software update for women across at universities all across the country who just sort of become feminist overnight. I was in college and I got to say it was fucking crazy and it is worth cursing for that. I'm not going to bleep that out for algorithm purposes. It was fucking crazy. 2014, I remember 2013, I'm a freshman, things are relatively normal. 2014, 
the VMAs are like the summer before I, I go for my, my third semester of college. And I go in and just all the girls are wearing flannels and beanies and they're all talking about rape culture and mansplaining. And I'm getting into arguments that I don't understand and that I understand a lot better now than I did then. But to me, I point to 2014 as like, it became unavoidable. And that's why I say it's the year the culture war started. Because to me, a war is something that you can't get away from. It's not just these little kerfuffles that were happening leading up to that. Like, you know, in 2009, they accused Resident Evil 5 of being racist because it was in Africa and there were black zombies. But like, unless you were really deep into the gaming community, you probably didn't hear about that. Uh, that's also very supposed funny to be one, white zombies in the that's Africa? a funny one that again it did happen you can look it up they accused resident evil 5 being racist but again you could avoid that 2014 is when it becomes like if you were even a little online or in college or like relatively young you would start to encounter these things that seemed from another dimension and for the first time in my life i'm asked my pronouns in 2014 in a gender studies class granted it was in a gender studies class but i started to see pronouns in people's bios just a couple years later yeah and then we start and it's kind of my legal spin on this but then we really start to see the rise in the social uh, social circles social credit type of things of a legal theory called disparate impact so you can't discriminate directly, right? You can't say, hey, no, no, no blacks can vote, right? We got rid of that. You um, can't say that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, once you have the passage of some of these laws, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, well, we started, or at least some um, attorneys were trying to push forward and it eventually did get recognized this concept of disparate impact is the idea that. A policy that is not quite racist or sexist or transphobic or whatever on its face, but yet has the impact of affecting a group disproportionately, then it becomes racist. This is when you start seeing the rise of racism, whatever, is power plus prejudice. And then that evolves from, I think, around the, you know, we get to close to 2020 where we start talking about well we really don't care about people's racist intent we just care about their racist if there's a racist outcome then you get ibram x candy and all that and those were the years that i really started thinking to myself like oh the disparate impact theory of discrimination is now seeping into how we socially define um you know, socially defined whether any individual given act is a constitutes racism, um, which is insane because those two theories don't work together. Disparate impact. It, it has to do with how groups come out and individual actions don't have anything to do with that. Um, but that's kind of when I started noticing that coming together is around those years, um, getting especially leading into 2015, 2016 with the rise of Donald Trump and him being the uh, emblem the standard bearer of white supremacy and racism well and the the, the wage gap the wage gap yes, was the all about gaps. disparate impact and yeah. i think people forget 2013 i left one thing out the first piece of legislation i believe barack obama signed into law was the lily ledbetter act which was all mm -hmm. about like making sure women can compare their pay stubs and make sure they're not getting paid 77 cents on the dollar that becomes a huge meme between 2013 and 2018 during the BuzzFeed yeah. Beyonce feminism thing. You don't really hear about it anymore. You don't really hear that much about the wage gap. But well, but that's because I think it's become, it's become taken as truth. Like we don't hear about it because there used to be prominent people like Christina Hoff Summers, like Jordan Peterson, like some big economists who were out there trying to fight this myth and they ended up losing the popular consensus. They were right in my opinion that it has to do with people's different preferences and what they go into careers and blah, 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 blah. People who listen to the show probably know those arguments. Um, but it became such a it with so many things that came out of this era, it became taken as a truism that women are paid less than men. They and just so, are. Yeah. And so did hands up, don't shoot. Unfortunately, yeah. you had representative Cori Bush of the sort of uh, not, I wouldn't just say the Black Lives Matter caucus, but she's in kind of the squad caucus. She's one of the yeah. newer members. She's kind of like the second wave, <laughs> the second generation, if we're going Pokemon linguistics, oh, second God. generation of squad Congress people includes. Corey Bush, and she goes on to Twitter every year to say that Michael Brown was shot with his hands up, screaming, don't shoot, and begging for his life. And a bunch of people like Ben Shapiro have to say, no, that's not what happened. But it gets exhausting. And eventually, a bunch of people take that as truth. And people think that Jacob Blake and Rayshard Brooks 
and a lot of other folks who did things that inevitably will get you shot by a cop. Rayshard Brooks, who tased and wrestled with a police officer. Jacob Blake, who pulled a knife on a cop after refusing commands that involved you know, guns being trained on him to not open the vehicle to his girlfriend's car, which had her kids inside of it and pull a knife. Out. <laughs> he, he was 100% upright while guns tra- were drained on him. I get, ends up getting shot and paralyzed. And people were like, this poor guy. Like we have to destroy Kenosha and Kyle Rittenhouse's life over this. You'll, you'll still hear people say that they think Jacob Blake was killed. I mean, or that Kyle Rittenhouse shot black people. Yeah, or that Kyle. I mean, that, that's all. Again, these are basic truisms in some of the blue and on spaces. Yeah. So this is the assault on the truth, and I think it really starts in 2014 with. All of these different assaults on the truth. Michael Brown wasn't shot with his hands up saying, don't shoot. The Gamergate thing was was totally blown out of proportion. Gamers just want to be left the hell alone and play video games. And yes, it's a male-dominated hobby. It's always going to have big titties and things going on like that. Uh, and they don't want that encroached on necessarily. And then, of course, the Beyonce thing, I think that's a falsehood in a way because it's like Beyonce is not an appropriate ambassador for <laughs> Beyonce is, if you ever actually listen to an interview with Beyonce, she's a very uninteresting person. She's a very talented person, but that there was something so disingenuous about like Beyonce, who has become sort of a meme now as like a boring person's idea of a cultural icon. Like I think people kind of become wiser to that. There's something so disingenuous that I think also had to do with the assault on the truth of saying like, if Beyonce's a feminist, you should be a feminist too. Yeah. There was it's something not like so Beyonce is really like carving some path. I mean, there have been famous female pop stars, even famous black female pop stars for decades and decades. Like, it's not like, oh, I destroyed the patriarchy because I was able to have a number one best selling album or whatever. Like, she first of all got famous by being part of a group of with two other black females. Like, it wasn't like she was, and maybe, maybe there's stuff about Beyonce's career that I don't know. But it seems to me to say, like, look at what a paragon of feminism she is by being another pop star. Like, that's yeah. not original. Well, and just the the single word on a neon sign, just mm. such a, like, obvious psyop. They didn't even, like, it's, it's not like she sang a song and changed the lyrics to something feminist. Or the song was, like, a, an empowering. I mean, I guess you could say her songs are vaguely empowering to women, like, yeah. to the left, to the left, get the fuck out of my house, you deadbeat piece of shit. I guess that's <laughs> Right. I don't know. It was very weird. And the assault on the truth would become much more uh, obvious and straightforward from there because 2015 is a really interesting year because I didn't really mention anything that has to do with LGBT for 2014. That's the one that kind of gets left out. I'm talking about feminist stuff, Black Lives Matter stuff. 2015 is the year of the LGBT thing getting out of control because mm-hmm. of a man named Caitlyn Jenner, who was once known as Bruce Jenner. Now, of course, what we learned in 2015 is that I should be like hung from the nearest tree (laughs) for saying what I just said, which is that Caitlyn Jenner is a biological male who was known for 50 years as Bruce Jenner, the, you know, you know, gold medal winning Olympic athlete. Uh, So Caitlyn Jenner comes out as trans in 2015, immediately wins woman of the year, immediately, no debate, <laughs> nary a, nary a, on, only a few comedy specials. Woman of the year, that's ESPN, right? ESPN or something. And, and, uh, you know, or of course, Sports Illustrated, one of know, those. Ricky Gervais and Dave Chappelle end up being able to feast on this kind of thing for a few years. But other than that, and like Bill Burr and some other comedic figures kind of making fun of it, people just kind of are like, okay, we're doing this now. And of course, that same year, Burgefell v. Hodges is the Supreme Court decision that says that the you know the, by a five four decision of a, a mandate from the Supreme Court, Anthony Kennedy basically said, "Let there be gay marriage across mm-hmm. all fifty states in the United States." And so the sort of gay lobby, the LGBT activist community, moves on from homosexuality, and much to the chagrin of people like Katie Herzog, who I had on the show, who said lesbians become extinct. Because all of yeah. a sudden, nobody wants to be lesbian or gay anymore. They all become trans. And that really goes into overdrive in 2015. So so you were younger than me at that time and, and more hip and with it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, when do you think the T started getting more and more capitalized and sh- overshadowing the L, G, and B? To the extent that they're a community whatsoever, which I think there's a lot of good writing and commentators right now saying that they shouldn't be a community considered together at all. But when did the T start becoming just a little more capitalized than the other letters? 
I think it would have to be 2014, 15, because I think of 2012 as like it was all about gay. It was gay marriage, right. same sex right. marriage. Barack Obama supports gay marriage. We don't have time for pronouns or anything like that yet. But gay marriage, repeal, don't ask, don't tell, I think might have been 2011, 2012. It's all about that. 2013, the, you know, the fact that the DSM was updated is kind of like inside baseball. 20, I, I feel like it was around that time. Because up to the point that same-sex marriage was still not legal in all 50 states, that was just a very obvious place to go if he wanted to be an LGBT advocate was to focus on gays, lesbians, and bisexuals trying to get married. Once that, you know, once you that train pulls into the station, you know, we've talked about this on the show before. I know this isn't the most original observation, but like the 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 the, 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 the it wasn't the transgender lobby; it was the LGBT lobby. But it becomes the trans lobby. Right. It just sort of becomes like, well, what's next? <laughs> like, like right. there's not a whole lot to be done for gays, lesbians, and bisexuals at this point. Um, I don't think they wanted to go the way of like third and fourth wave feminism where they were going to be like, well, catcalling and like things that have nothing to do with any legal structure. It was kind of actually kind of a brilliant move because – the feminist stuff was hilarious at this time, by the way. Cat calling was like the worst thing, oh, apparently, in All the, the world. Videos. In the world. Cat calling and manspreading and mansplaining, men being condescending to women, became like, again, something that you deserve the freaking death penalty for, according to Beyonce feminists and BuzzFeed feminists. But yeah, 2015 is probably when trans starts to be something that if you're very slightly online or you're just somebody who's like under the age of 25 or around the age of 25 or younger – you, you would notice it because you'd be around people that are trans or are trans activists um, or who were gay, lesbian, and bisexual. And you, so if you're in or around that community, you would start to see the, no pun intended, transition over to there are no lesbians anymore. <laughs> There's mm-hmm. a bunch of trans men. Um, and in 2016, it's no wonder that Jordan Peterson – exploded right around the time that Trump got elected because a bunch of trans radical activists at the University of Toronto were, you know, accosting him at his events uh, where he was uh, speaking out in opposition to Bill C-16, which materialized incredibly fast, by the way. 2015 is when this all starts. Bill C-16 is 2016, uh, which is, uh, it, it didn't criminalize, but it sort of made, I think, a civil penalty out of misgendering in the in, in the Canadian government, which is where Jordan Peterson kind of comes up. And of course, that 2016, why even bother talking about Jordan Peterson? It's the year Donald Trump got elected president of the United States. There, That is another before and after, <laughs> I would say, is yeah. Donald Trump getting elected president. That was when I f- had sort of my red pill moment. I know that's kind of outdated nomenclature language at this point, kind of cringeworthy, but I, I still kind of like the red pill metaphor for what it's worth, but I kind of had my red pill moment because I discovered Jordan Peterson around that time and I see the reaction to Donald Trump getting elected. It was, I, I feel like there was sort of a detente on like very basic things like politically motivated violence up until Donald Trump got elected. I think that if on a college campus, a Republican was actually physically assaulted, that most of the administrators and professors would rally around like, we can't have that here. And that t- what became known as Trump derangement syndrome in 2016 after Trump was elected made it so that acts of politically motivated violence became basically acceptable because Donald Trump's election was considered an act of violence. It was so vile to the left and so awful that it was like, it was a declaration of war on all that was decent and good. And I, and I really don't like Donald Trump. And so I understand it on some level. I really do. And I was upset when he won too. And I'm still upset that he won. I'm upset that he's running again. But I, I look back and I go, that was when the culture war became like a hot war because mm-hmm. you see the UC Berkeley riot, um, the Evergreen College meltdown. Those happen within like four months of each other. And I, I'll say this about the Evergreen College meltdown. I believe that you can make the argument that was like an attempted lynching of Brett Weinstein. If you put Brett oh. Weinstein alone in a room with the activists who led the uh, anti Brett Weinstein protests, at Evergreen College of 2017 and said, you have full legal immunity for the next 120 seconds to do what you will with Mr. Weinstein, he would not make it out of that room. That was absolutely, I mean, at one point, there's a great documentary by Mike Nana. I always recommend people look up about this. He is told by the campus police office that he is really not safe on campus and that they are powerless to help him should he be physically uh, harmed by these. If I remember that story correctly, 
that some of the actus were actually stopping cars while arms. I think looking for like Heather. Hats or something. Yeah. Looking for either him or Heather. Like we're actually literally stopping cars on, hunting for him and I, Heather hiding his wife. That was a huge moment for me that really accelerated my political transformation. What happened to Brett Weinstein was and remains one of the most disturbing things I think that has ever happened on a college campus. And maybe not so much for what happened, but what for very nearly did happen. And Brett Weinstein knows this. He alludes to this in the documentary by Mike Nana that I'm not sure has a name. If you just look up Mike Nana Evergreen documentary on YouTube, it'll come up. Um, It's a great three-part documentary. And each part has a name. I know there's one, I think, called like The Hunted Individual, um, which is about kind of what we're talking about now. But great documentary. Weinstein clearly knows and I think a lot of people have come to understand what was going to happen if he w- did not really play it safe with where he was at the time. And and I think he did end up quitting and you know he ended up getting a settlement and no longer being physically present at Evergreen State University. Um, and, he, and you know, what we saw happening to Weinstein is a story that seems to be likely to repeat itself for eons to come. But 2017 you know, it's the first full year of Donald Trump's presidency. And within four months of his presidency, I always like to point out 2017 is a big phase shift. There's the UC Berkeley riots when Milo Yiannopoulos attempts to speak there. There's the Evergreen College meltdown and James Damore getting fired from Google for saying that maybe women are a little bit different than men, (laughs) possibly. Yeah. That all happens within like four months. Even in a much more nuanced way. Like he looked, he was, and I think, I can't remember who it is, but put it like this, like he was an engineer, like maybe a little spectrumy. And he went out and they were asking questions like, why aren't there more women here? So we went out and tried to find the answer. And he talked about how women so are, naive. You know, different, yeah, different preferences <laughs> that they're. He tried the to really answer the question him. that they were asking. <laughs> right. And the thing, if I remember correctly, that really got him uh, pilloried was he described how, you know, the major, the big five personality types that women are higher in trait neuroticism. That was the thing. It wasn't anything about what, like the totality of the long, I think it was a fairly lengthy thing he wrote, uh, the, the, the Google memo, the Demore memo. Um, yeah, that, that one was... I, that one really bothered me because it was just like the, you could see that this was just a kid who was a guy who was trying to answer a question he was given. And he didn't understand the import of what he had done, uh, probably not until it was actually just literally blowing up in his face. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, it the James Damore thing, the Brett Weinstein thing, these are all people where it's like, I shouldn't know who these people are. That's like, right. These are just people who are trying to stand up for very basic reality in in many cases, especially Weinstein, who had very liberal views up to that point. Uh, Peterson's another good example. And the interesting thing about, I would say, 2016 to like around 2019 is it's also when there's kind of a glimmer of hope in the culture war because the IDW starts to form and you start to feel like there is a bit of an exodus from the left. There are people that are trying to ring a bell and be Paul Revere and say like, hey, something is happening on the left that isn't good. But it becomes evident towards the latter half of 2018, which sort of starts as the year of Jordan Peterson. He demolishes Kathy Newman on national television. His book blows up. It starts very promising. And then by the end of 2018, it's become a bannable offense on Twitter to quote unquote misgender people. Megan Murphy is used as sort of the test case and the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings happen. And what I'll say about the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearings ha- uh, it happening is that was my moment where I actually was no longer a Democrat. I, I had sort of been like an anti-woke insurgent, Dave Rubin style Democrat for a little while at that point. But I left the Democratic Party because in my opinion, if you are a man, if you are a natal man and you- Important qualifier. Yeah, there, if you are a man and you saw what the Democratic Party did to Brett Kavanaugh and you are still a Democrat, if you really saw what it was they were actually doing with Brett Kavanaugh and you are still a Democrat- I think you're a useful idiot. I got to be honest. I really don't understand how self-respecting men remain partisan Democrats to this day after what happened to Brett Kavanaugh. That was one of the most insane things I have ever seen in my life. And I pray to God, I never see too many things. And and of course, these prayers have gone unanswered, but I do (laughs) already because we're going to talk about 2020 in a second. We're getting there, folks. But I really hate to think that too many things 
more disgusting than what was done to Brett Kavanaugh could be done in the name of Me Too or feminism or whatever. Uh, because that really was essentially the Democratic Party saying like, this is what we think of men. They're a fucking pawn. We can just accuse them of some shit if they happen to be in our way, if they fall on the wrong side of the friend or foe distinction. And of course, if they're a friend like Joe Biden and they get accused of something, we might help them out. But if you're Brett Kavanaugh and you get accused of something, we are going to make it into like a like a feature length film, like a mini series. They they still mm-hmm. should make a mini series about it. It was crazy. Yeah, I, the the Kavanaugh thing. Really, like I, I try not to let things in the news anymore. Just actually, distressed me, like because I see so much of it as play acting and, and dumb corruption bullshit. But I remember before the Kavanaugh thing, in a little background, I went to I was a pretty nerdy law student, and when you're kind of in that uh, way of thinking, you have some reverence for the court. Um, and at least for some point, if maybe I was naive, I probably was, is you like to think the court is coming to the quote unquote right answer. That these are the nine best legal scholars in the country and that they've risen to the very top of our profession. And there's an idealism about the court and the justices. Like you refer to them by the, like, it's kind of weird to say this like out loud like this. It's like you refer, their names don't just mean the human being. Like when I hear Anton and Scalia, I don't just think of a, you know, kind of pudgy Italian guy. I, you know, very Catholic. I think of all of things he wrote about the inverse commerce clause, what he wrote about originalism, how he broke from the conservative part of the court when it came to like individual civil liberties, like fourth amendment cases. The Kavanaugh, while confirmation hearings were always circuses, the Kavanaugh thing was just like everybody has finally shed, and maybe it's just my perspective, but shed any pretense that this is about anything but politics. This isn't about putting the best, most qualified person on the court. This isn't about someone. It, this is truly about partisan and, and and it is manifesting in this such a disgusting way like even if they had a 100 percent proof positive that kavanaugh had done what he was accused of doing which no one does you know the way it was all conducted was just shameful it was a kangaroo court to try and ruin a man's life and to yeah. to destroy his legacy when at what was supposed to be his greatest professional achievement over an at best unproven and at worst, extremely specious accusation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can look back at, there were a few Democrats that acquitted themselves in a way that was sort of uh, taking place on this earth and in reality, like Amy Klobuchar. But you look back at like Maisie Hirono, Kirsten Gillibrand, Kamala Harris has to be the worst offender. If you go back and watch the Kamala Harris interrogation of Brett Kavanaugh, where at the end, she asks him a question and before he can even finish his answer says, we're just going to move on. During this moment where she is going out of her way to destroy this man's life over these, again, unproven, in my opinion, pretty obviously false accusations, but we can re- that gets relitigated from time to time. That would take another whole show to go over exactly what happened with Christine Blasey Ford. But you know, just the fact that Time Magazine on their cover, of course, has you know, in, in, when when I'm sure that when this happened to Clarence Thomas in the 1990s, all of the magazine covers were Clarence Thomas with his hand swearing an oath and Anita Hill doing the same. There were no photos, no glamorous photos, no 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 you know, uh, ceremonious photos of Brett Kavanaugh when this was happening. It was all about Christine Blasey Ford and how she was a victim and how Brett Kavanaugh needed to take it on the chin that he was going to be slandered as a racist, a rapist for the rest of his life and probably a racist mm-hmm. <laughs> for, for whatever reason. But that was one of the most disturbing moments. Um, and again, I, I, one of the spicier things I've probably said on the show before is just like, I, I think you're a useful idiot. If you're a man who is a partisan Democrat who does not have at the very least a very tenacious relationship with the Democratic Party, uh, after seeing that, and you really saw what happened there, I think that you I mean, you're 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 a sheep to wolves. Like I think you just don't understand yeah. when somebody doesn't want you or, or sees you as a useful idiot. Um, but to finish out the timeline here, because today's episode is basically just going to be a crash course in 
how we kind of view the timeline of what's happened with wokeness. And we'll probably make it kind of a two-parter where in the next episode, we'll talk about some of the prehistory that might have led to that point before wokeness, kind of proto-wokeness, what happened with the civil rights movement and legal structures that were created in the 1960s, sort of alluding to things you might hear on the new right with folks like Oren, who I I bring up often just because he's a friend of the show on the new right. And, um, you know, Christopher Caldwell's Age of Entitlement. We're going to talk about that as well, but I want to finish out the timeline for today by saying uh, we're talking about 2018, Kavanaugh, 2019. I think the most interesting thing that happens in 2019 is the Democratic primary start for 2020. And at, at by 2019, between 2014 and 2019, something really interesting happens. Something Things that were unthinkable for a Democrat to support in 2014 become litmus tests in 2019. Every Democratic candidate for president says they have to support abortion to the point of birth, open borders, and gender-affirming care, which of course is the mutilation and, and, and mutilation and medicalization of children in the name of gender ideology, often referred to as gender-affirming care by the incumbent president of the United States and his entire party. Uh, I will point out that even Andrew Yang, who is often considered one of the two sort of anti-woke candidates who ran in the Democratic primary that year along with Tulsi Gabbard. Andrew Yang supported abortion to the point of birth. I could tell in the interview where he was asked that question by Dave Rubin that it pained him somewhat to say it. If you go back and watch, it's a very interesting clip. Dave Rubin asks if there should be any limits on abortion, and Andrew Yang kind of gulps and goes, I think that's between a woman and her, and her doctor, which of course has become what every single Democrat, especially Democratic men, says about that issue. But Andrew Yang, Joe Biden, everyone had to support abortion to the point of birth, open borders, literally decriminalizing border crossings, by the way. You can find clips from those debates in 2019 where people support decriminalizing border crossings. Just like open borders, why the hell not? We'll we'll give you a traffic ticket, basically, if you come here illegally. (laughs) Yeah. So that's what we noticed in 2019. And that essentially says that the IDW failed because what was the IDW's ultimate goal? I think it was to materialize someone like Tulsi Gabbard was probably the closest thing who was the one person who ran for president and maybe tried to tell the Democratic Party like, hey, let's let's do away with identity politics. Let's focus on what Tulsi Gabbard liked to focus on for many years, which was the same thing Bernie Sanders liked to focus on before 2019, which was you know, class politics, which remains pretty popular to this day, even with folks like myself who may not be fans of uh, social policy on the left, but still sympathize somewhat with some of the class politics and economic positions of the left. Uh, not to the point of being a socialist, but no. you know, to some extent, uh, as as a middle class person, as a member of the people are going to make fun of me because I forget which one's the bourgeoisie and which one's the proletariat, but the middle class one, the, <laughs> the proletariat. As a member of the proletariat, see, I knew I, the proletariat. Yeah, the proletariat. Easy from my so, from <laughs> from my bourgeoisie position, I know the difference. <laughs> so anyway, we're at twenty twenty. We've made it. We've talked through what I consider to be the meat of the culture war, which is 2014 to 2020. I consider it a six-year affair because in 2020, not only does COVID happen and the government basically says, like, you're all so cowed at this point, we'll just tell you to stay inside and do whatever the fuck we tell you. That happens, but also a man named George Floyd dies. This is the most recent stuff. We don't have to harp on this for too long. You all remember. And a man named George Floyd dies, some people would say from a fentanyl overdose, some people, including a jury in Minneapolis, would say from the knee of a man named Derek Chauvin, whose knee was on his neck for nine minutes and who according to a court of law, uh, suffocated George Floyd, uh, who also had an enlarged heart and was on a more than lethal dose of fentanyl, but it is what it is. Uh, this happens and you all remember just all hell breaks loose. I mean, there's, I, I, that's kind of an understatement. <laughs> I think the, 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 the country is set on fire for about six months, as I recall. Um, yeah. and it's completely unabated. The riots are out of control. It's nothing like what happened in Ferguson six years prior, or certainly what happened with Trayvon Martin. Uh, it seemed like there was a new George Floyd every like five and a half minutes, whether it's Jacob Blake or Rayshard Brooks, and each one was more ridiculous than the last. Um, eventually, but, and actually, that, so that's the a point. And I know you want to wrap soon, so I'll, I'll, I'll make this quick. No, go ahead. This is also when the decoupling, the the obvious decoupling of the media from reality started to occur is before George Floyd, the conservatives who were protesting lockdowns were told they were a danger to public health. When people were shoulder to shoulder in the streets of major cities after George Floyd died, the medical establishment comes out and says the real virus is racism. And these people are doing just fine. 
that I think was a huge moment during this. And then you've got, was it during Kenosha when the mostly peaceful riots meme that was of uh, Chiron says mostly peaceful riots while it's cities burning literally on I fire think, on yeah, the air the summer of yeah, on the air. The summer of 2020, I think, is that probably if you were to ask a lot of people, when did you stop trusting the mainstream media? I'll bet but most of them say June, July 2020. It, it was also the time when it became clear that people, including people in the IDW, which is really how I identified at the time, were concerned about our institutions and trying to save them. 2020, when it was like, okay, uh, those are gone. <laughs> like every yeah. single institute, sense-making institution that we were trying themselves. to just like save and be like, let's fix this. Let's, let's heal this and make it better. Was like, they're, go- they're done. <laughs> the, the, the media, the big tech, the, the academia, the Democratic Party, they're just all gone. They're just dead. They have stopped even trying to pay lip service to their original purposes. The media is theoretically, you know, the agents of truth give you the information so you can make up your own mind. Academia, theoretically, a bastion of free speech where things are debated out in good faith. Uh, the Democratic Party, theoretically, sort of a a pro labor class oriented party, but instead they're all bowing with kente cloths to a statue of George Floyd. Oh, uh, so cringe. I mean, th- it, it, every day something like that was happening. I mean, every day. Uh, I, I mean, Jenny Durkin in Seattle giving the Chaz over to the Wolves, literally being like, we're just going to let Antifa have a neighborhood in Seattle for a little while. Mm-hmm. We'll just, just let them have it for like a couple of weeks. It'll be fine. And of course, immediately three black teenagers are shot to death by Chaz's improvised security force, uh, also known as cops, which of course is what they were <laughs> railing against. But uh, let's see, I, I shat on big tech, the media, the Democratic Party. I feel like I'm forgetting... It's hard to remember at this point, but all of these sense-making institutions, they, I mean, the, the NGOs like the ACLU that used to at least pay lip service to freedom of speech, the ACLU LU famously, you know, f- uh, fought for the legal rights of the KKK and even supported Milo Yiannopoulos as recently as like 2017, um, they they fold. They start becoming all about like trans men and pregnant men. It just became like all of those institutions that you were like, please, if you if we can fix these institutions, it'll, it'll life will feel normal again. Like you guys will help mm-hmm. us make sense of the world, and you'll tell everyone that no bl- cops are not exterminating black people in the tr- street. No, there's no such thing as the wage gap. No, we don't live in a Handmaid's Tale. No, men can't get pregnant. Like we were hoping that the cavalry would arrive because Dave Rubin or Jordan Peterson or. Andrew Yang or Tulsi Gabbard or whoever it was would somehow shoot the port of the Death Star. <laughs> I don't know. Get some right. kind of victory. Jordan Peterson probably came closest. I'll give him the credit. He had a moment with Kathy Newman in, in January of 2018 where a lot of people, I think, got red billed. And he he sort of almost ended the wage gap discourse there. But it didn't quite do the trick. And in 2020, reality falls. And we end up kind of where we are now, where I say the culture war ended in 2020 with the decisive woke victory and what we're left with, you know, it, it was, it, it, it's the, I mean, Sam Hyde famously said, and I'm not a, a huge fan of Sam Hyde. I do think he's a really interesting figure, but one of the smartest things I think I've heard him say is that the riots of 2020 weren't riots. They were victory parties. They were a victory mm. dance. They were a victory ritual of saying like, look what we can do. Look at the level of control we have. They were dancing on the grave of Western civilization. That's what those were. And, and it was in the fact that they were saying like, hey, remember how two seconds ago we said nobody could gather for any reason, even in a church, even at a funeral? Well, here we are gathering for our little victory party because fuck you conservatives in middle America and blah, blah, blah. So all of this is to say, I do believe the culture war has in effect ended as we knew it. But I don't want to just leave everyone with a black pill with that for today. I would say that I think we are in a stage where there, you know, we are the rebels. There is an authoritarian sort of woke orthodoxy that is fully in power as of 2020. They operate through largely through corporate HR endorsed corporate fiat, if you will. Uh, They operate with woke capital and at the the current moment with the power of the federal government with Joe Biden as kind of a almost sort of like a a, a puppet state of the woke orthodoxy, his administration sort of acting that way in a way. Um, But, you know, I think there are glimmers of hope like the IDW was that hopefully won't meet the same fate as the IDW because I think that things are getting a lot more aggressive than the IDW ever intended to be. 
I think mm-hmm. I think that the alarms are being raised by people like Chris Rufo, Ron DeSantis, who I've said on the on the show before, I'm big fans of, and that you know we are in the position of being more than underdogs or less than underdogs, if you will. Uh, I do think that it it looks bleak, to be honest, but I do think that there's an opportunity to, you know, topple this authoritarian state that we're essentially living in. I do think that is possible at this time, but it's not really a war so much as it is like a rebellion. You know, this is not two warring, you know, fully empowered states, if you will. This is a nation taken over by a parasitic religion and small bands of rebels who are willing to say the things we say on this show that can get us banned from YouTube, that can get us banned from iTunes, that can get us fired from our jobs, and that so many of you I know are willing to say as well, and I commend each and every one of you who says those kinds of things. And we we do that because we want to try and take civilization back. And I guess today's show, maybe to some of you, it seemed kind of pointless because it's like, why are you relitigating this stuff? I wanted to tell the story uh, that I hope one day to say to, to tell to my children and my grandchildren, and I hope it'll have an epilogue where we win in the end. And I don't know if we will. Often it seems like we won't, but I thought today would be an interesting exercise in telling the story with some goddamn truth. Instead of telling the story that the media will tell you, which is that Donald Trump was a fascist dictator and Joe Biden slayed him and now we're a nice, beautiful, gay utopia. (laughs) I mean, I guess we forgot to cover all that, you know, fascist genocide that occurred between 2016 and 2020. (laughs) We left it out. onto our script. Sorry, folks. Yeah. But anyway, thank you for indulging today's, you know, recap essentially of the past 10 years. (laughs) of the history of yeah. Western civilization. But I, I do think it's worth doing. And if it seems pointless to some of you, again, I would posit it's good to say these things and to point out little kernels of truth along the way. Like Brett Kavanaugh probably isn't a rapist. Caitlyn Jenner is a man. Donald Trump was not Adolf Hitler. It's good that Ben and I, thank you for bringing that up, Ben, because it's good to bring up things like that and tell this story, even though it seems maybe a little repetitive. And hopefully some of you got something out of it. So we are going to talk more about this. I know I said a couple of weeks ago we'd probably stay away from politics, but I was in the mood to to talk about this ourselves. sort of thing again during kind of a lull in the news cycle. So I hope you've enjoyed today's Veritas podcast. Next time, I think we will try to do kind of a two-parter for this and talk about things that happened between the 1960s and 2012. I think that's an important part of this that I will concede I didn't pay enough attention to until very recently. And I do credit again. I give him lots of credit because I'm a fan of his, Orrin McIntyre, other folks that I've spoken to, Dave, the distributist, uh, who's also been on the show. Um, I credit people like that to waking me up to the fact that 2012 isn't when this all, it, it wasn't when the seeds were planted. It may feel like when it started, but there are things that happened before then. So you can look forward to more analysis of things that happened before 2012, probably on our next episode of the Veritas podcast. And we appreciate you all being with us and we'll see you next time on the Veritas podcast.